the 15th century was a dark time in medieval Europe. There were all these instruments and methods of torture and killing for all the worst criminals. You would assume, for example, that this man, Giordano Bruno, burning at the stake, did something unthinkable. Do you know what his crime was? He claimed that the stars were like the sun and all of them had planets going around them. What was so wrong about this? Well, there was one group of people that did not like what he said, the Catholic Church. Let's start at the beginning and see how things got to this stage. Hi, my name is Pranav and you're watching Sciences Dope. How does the universe work is a question that had baffled people for a long time. Let's start with the ancient Greece where some early astronomers began looking at the skies trying to find answers. And when they looked up all they had were more questions like what are these stars and planets, how do they move etc and they started looking for explanations. One of the earliest explanations was given by this man, Aristotle. He said that the universe was finite and unchanging with the earth at its center. The idea was called geocentrism. Additionally, the heavens were filled with a light substance called ether which was moving in circles. Celestial objects like the sun, moon, planets were stuck to this ether and hence also went around in circular orbits around the earth. And at the time this was a good explanation. It explained things people saw like the rising and setting of the sun or the change in position of the planets over time. And it formed the basis of many ideas we had back then including one really popular book, the bible. For example consider these verses. According to them, earth being still was God's design and the sun moving around the earth a testimony to God's power. In fact, one of the main ideas in the Bible is that earth is a special place and so is everything that lives on it, including humans. So no wonder that this special place happens to be the center of the universe. And for a long time, no one really questioned this model even though it was far from perfect. For example, if you look at the planet Mars in the night sky, you'll notice it has an eastward trajectory. But once every two years, Mars will turn back and start heading westwards like it's had a bit too much to drink. But eventually after a few days, it turns back around and heads back east again. Why was this happening if Mars was going around the earth in a nice little circle? This question kept many sky watchers awake at night. Well, actually if they watched the night sky, they were probably already awake at night, I guess. Anyway, this pattern was called the retrograde motion of Mars. And the same thing could be observed for other planets and this could be seen with the naked eye. Remember, there were no telescopes back then, so we didn't know what was happening and no one had any answers. In comes Ptolemy with a solution to this. In his model, he made the planets go around the Earth, but not in simple circles. Planets also went around in their orbits in these mini circles called epicycles. So the orbits basically look like this, with these sections being the cause of the retrograde motion. And with time, these models influenced popular culture. We've already seen how pastors in the Bible have a geocentric point of view. These ideas reached their peak during the 16th century and then they all came crashing down. Like a house of cards on a windy day. And the first gust of wind came from a Polish astronomer called Nicholas Copernicus. You see, even though Ptolemy's model explained retrograde, it wasn't without its faults. First, it was not as elegant as Aristotle's model. There was a jump from neat circular orbits to whatever the hell this is. And second, to make this model fit observations, new hacks had to be introduced. For example, planet trajectories could only be explained if the epicycles rotated non-uniformly. Or you had to add more epicycles to the existing epicycle. This made the model insanely complicated complicated to use. So what was the alternative? Copernicus had an idea. Instead of having the sun go around the earth, why couldn't the earth go around the sun? And similarly other planets, but can it explain retrograde motion? Yes it can, let's look at the same clip but from the point of view of the earth. Not only was this model much simpler than Ptolemy's epicycle model, it explained observations and gave better predictions. But there was a problem. Copernicus did not share the model publicly and discussed it only with his close friends. And no, this is not because he was an introvert. To answer why, we have to turn our attention to the Catholic Church of the 15th century. You see, in Europe during this time, Catholicism was the predominant religion and the Catholic Church had a lot of power. For instance, they were considered distributors of passports to heaven, something that would ensure that you could get into heaven after you die. And these passports called indulgences were sold to whoever paid the most 
money. And as you can guess, there was a long line of people willing to buy them. The sale of these indulgences and other things that the church did resulted in it amassing a fortune. And if there's one thing we can learn from history, it's that with great wealth comes great power and influence. Soon the Catholic Church became one of the most powerful forces in Europe. And whatever the church said, people believed in and it became the doctrine of the day. Only a handful of people questioned these doctrines. After all, getting in the bad books of the church was not a good idea because they used this power they had in ugly ways. An example of this was the Inquisition, an institution that punished people for speaking up against the dogmas of the church. People who did so were labeled heretics and heresy was not tolerated. The Inquisition spread all across Europe to Spain, France, Portugal and Italy. Books were banned, people were imprisoned and opposing ideas were clamped down with extreme brutality. All this to make sure that people were scared to even think about alternative ideas. And this is why Copernicus was scared to express his ideas publicly. He did so only a year before he died in a book called On the Revolution of Heavenly Spheres. Smart. And once it was published, his ideas of heliocentrism gained a handful of followers who appreciated the model's simplicity and the power of its predictions. And how did the church react to this? Well, they engaged in a rational discussion with the supporters of heliocentrism. To put forward their arguments, they used evidence and logic and did not resort to violent methods. <laughs> okay, I can't say that with a straight face. They did the exact opposite of that. This story only gets much darker from here. We're gonna talk about a man who was labeled a heretic by the Roman Inquisition. And his fate was much less fortunate than Copernicus. The year is 1576. In a monastery in Naples, a 22-year-old Giordano Bruno is confused about what to do. He was caught possessing books written by the Dutch philosopher Erasmus. The problem? Those books were banned by the Catholic Church and they were illegal to hold. But this was not the first time Bruno's flair for critical thinking and questioning dogmas landed him in trouble. He regularly questioned the teachings of the church and got away with it. But this time, it was different. They passed an indictment against Against him, and soon he'll be arrested. Should he stay and defend himself or should he run? Bruno decides to run, leaving the monastery to go to Genoa. His stay in Genoa is brief, from there he goes to Turin and then Venice. He moves from one city to another without a destination inside. He can't seem to stay in one place for long because wherever he goes, he pisses off the people in charge by questioning their dogmas. And just like that, he wanders all of Europe spending time in Switzerland, England, France, and Germany. During his travels, he encounters new and exciting ideas like heliocentrism and he quickly becomes a supporter. He writes essays and books arguing for it and even goes so far as to claim that stars are just like the sun with planets going around them. And just like the earth, these planets must have life on them. Was all this acceptable to say? Hell no! These statements directly contradicted the teachings of the church. It meant that the earth was not a special place and that humans were not special. We were not the ultimate creation of God. This ruffled a lot of feathers in the Vatican. And because of this, Bruno could not return home. The threat of the Inquisition dangled on his neck like a sharp knife ready to strike. But in 1591, 15 years after he first fled, he receives a letter. This letter brings with it an opportunity to return home. It's from a wealthy man in Venice. He's impressed with Bruno's intellect and wants him to be his tutor. Bruno is confused again, should he stay or return to Venice? On the one hand, there is still a looming threat. On the other hand, Venice is a pretty liberal state. The Inquisition doesn't have much power there. Besides, it seems to be losing some steam in recent years and there's a good chance he'll be safe. Bruno throws caution to the wind and returns to Venice. And you guessed it, this would prove to be a fatal mistake. A mere two months after going there, he's betrayed <laughs> by his patron and handed over to the Roman Inquisition. Bruno is arrested. He would spend the next seven years in jail, charged with heresy and multiple counts. These were his crimes, speaking against the church's ministers, questioning the divinity of Christ and the Trinity, doubting the virginity of Mary, claiming that the human soul is reincarnated after death, an idea directly contradicting the Christian belief in heaven and hell. The Inquisition finds him guilty, but there's one way he can escape. He has to renounce his beliefs publicly. Bruno refuses. He's not going to bow down to the church's might. 
and for that Bruno is punished with a death sentence. As the judge reads out his sentence, Bruno replies, perhaps you pronounce this statement against me with greater fear than I receive it. How badass was that? In February of 1600, in a busy Roman street, he faces the consequences of speaking out. They shut his tongue with a metal clamp to imprison his wicked words and he was set on fire. The year is 1609. A 45-year-old Galileo Galilei teaching at the University of Padua gets news from Holland. A Dutch eyeglass maker named Hans Lippershey has designed a device called the spyglass. A device that makes it easy to see faraway objects. Galileo's eyes lit up. As a professor of astronomy, this is exactly what he'd been waiting for. Galileo wanted to point this device at the night sky. Taking inspiration from Lippershey, he gets to work and builds his own telescope, and he turned it towards Jupiter. Galileo observed that there were four objects around Jupiter and they were moving in a peculiar way. Sometimes they would disappear for a few days and just appear again. They clearly weren't stars, so what were they? Galileo concluded that they were the moons of Jupiter, much like Earth's moon. In honor of Galileo, these moons would later go on to be called the Galilean moons of Jupiter, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. But why was this discovery so important? You see, one of the criticisms of heliocentrism dealt with the motion of the moon. The argument was this, if the Earth were to go around the sun, what would happen to the moon? Won't it be left behind? But that's not what we observe, right? So the only way it wouldn't be left behind as the Earth went around the sun was if the Earth was somehow pulling it. But the moon is such a huge and heavy object, how can it just be pulled along like that. Galileo's observations put an end to these questions. Since a similar behavior was seen with Jupiter and its moons, why couldn't Earth also pull its moon like that? He didn't have an exact explanation for what was causing this pulling behavior, but that was a good enough argument at the time. Galileo next observed that Venus had different faces, just like the moon. But unlike the moon, these faces had different sizes. A full Venus was much smaller than a new Venus. None of the geocentric Centric models could explain such a vast difference in size. If Venus went around the Earth, then the size would remain the same, but why was the size changing? The Copernican model had an answer. Venus and Earth were both going around the Sun. The heliocentric theory had to be right. This discovery was a bombshell to the scientific community. A lot of astronomers who were previously skeptical of the heliocentric model now accepted it in the face of this new evidence. Galileo himself became a strong advocate of heliocentrism. He wrote essays arguing for it and had heated debates with people who disagreed. And and all this did not go unnoticed. The Catholic Church was watching. They did not like having their dogmas questioned and definitely did not like the people who championed this questioning. And soon, the church would have its opportunity. In 1615, Galileo's essay supporting heliocentrism was submitted to the Inquisition. A year later, the Inquisition banned heliocentrism, claiming it was a heretical and foolish theory. Books that were speaking in favor of heliocentrism were banned, and this included Copernicus's book. The Pope ordered Galileo to renounce his ideas, and Galileo agreed. He wanted to maintain a low profile and not create any trouble for himself. And he did this for the next 15 years, but things changed in 1632 when he did his next book drop. You see, Galileo hadn't just abandoned his beliefs in heliocentrism. He firmly believed that his telescopic observations provided enough evidence for the heliocentric theory. So he began writing a book called Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems. As the title suggests, the book was a dialogue between heliocentrists and geocentrists in the form of a debate. The geocentrists would often express skepticism for heliocentrism and the heliocentrists would use observational evidence to convince him. For example, things like mountains on the moon, faces of Venus, moons of Jupiter, etc. that we've already discussed. But how was this possible? Did the church not oppose it? Well, Galileo took permission from the Pope and the Inquisition before publishing it. They agreed on one condition. Galileo could not advocate for heliocentrism. All he could do was remain neutral and present arguments for both sides. Galileo agreed. But when the book came out, everything changed. You see, in Galileo's book, the geocentrist would often end up making a mockery of himself because uh, the evidence was always against him. 
the heliocentrist would win every argument because uh, he had observations to back up his claims. And the church saw this as Galileo advocating for heliocentrism. And as you can guess, the church was not happy. Galileo was brought to Rome for his inquisition trial. And this time the punishment was stricter. He was asked to condemn his opinions. His books, current and any he may write in the future were all banned. Especially the one that started it all. He was not allowed to speak publicly in favor of heliocentrism ever again. That was unless he was willing to face the consequences. He was placed under house arrest and would remain there for the rest of his life. There is a story that when Galileo was forced to renounce his theory in front of the Inquisition, he rebelliously uttered the words, even so it does move, referring to the earth moving around the sun. But the jury is still out on the validity of that story. This is how the Catholic Church tried to stop the progress of science. But what was the aftermath of all this? Did the church succeed? After people like Newton and Kepler, the heliocentric theory was further established. As telescopes became more powerful, we learned more about the solar system. Today, we have mountains of evidence to support these ideas. So, no, the church did not succeed. And all because of people like Giordano Bruno and Galileo Galilei, who stood strong against the might of the church. And for that, they remembered even today. Giordano Bruno has become a symbol of free speech all over the world. He has found pop culture references in books, poems, music and even TV shows. Here he is in Cosmos, a very popular documentary hosted by Neil deGrasse Tyson. And if you're ever in Rome, make sure you pay his statue a visit. On his execution anniversary, you'll find atheists and free thinkers gathering here. Although if you ever become an astronaut and go to the moon, you'll find him there as well. There is a crater named after him. And do I even have to say anything about Galileo? It would be difficult to find someone who hasn't heard of him. You learn about him in schools, not just in the context of astronomy but also in physics and engineering. But what about the Catholic Church? Did they change their opinion on Bruno and Galileo? Well, yes, a hundred years after Galileo's death, the church unbanned heliocentric texts including Galileo's and Copernicus's books. But we'd have to wait another 250 years for a formal apology. When in 1992, Pope John Paul II apologized on behalf of the church. A bit too late but it's better than nothing. Giordano Bruno, on the other hand, had to wait longer. In the year 2400 years after Bruno's death, Cardinal Angelo Sodano said that his death was regretful, but his inquisitors did it for the common good. That's not really an apology, but make of it what you will. A few months later, Pope John Paul II gave a general apology for all the atrocities committed by the church in the past. Does this include Bruno? Uh, I don't know. As I've said many times so far in this video, this story is a perfect example of the triumph of free speech. Not only that, it shows the purpose of free speech. Free speech is not, for example, for anyone to announce their hatred of a group freely. Free speech is meant to question power and authority. And when someone's free speech is being curtailed using authority, that's a red flag showing that that authority should not be in a position of power. Before I end the video, I want to add that videos like these are expensive for me to make. And if you like watching this video, I'd really appreciate it if you support me on Patreon, Buy Me Coffee or YouTube memberships. Also, if you like this video, you might also like this one I did on how a small observation in bees led to a Nobel Prize. Like this one, that video is also a very interesting elaboration on the scientific method. I'll see you in the next one. Till then, remember, science is dope.